All right. Um, good afternoon. <clears throat> um, we're going to have, uh, at least here at the uh, Winston-Salem site, people kind of uh, trickling in over time. Um, they're still upstairs eating. But I'm going to go ahead and start um, um, on my talk about uh, vaginitis. And as you can tell, I'm not Dr. McNeil. We switched uh, slots because we weren't sure what was going on with uh, her child care situation today. So we went ahead and preemptively switched. Um, so uh, disclosures are the same as you saw earlier, um, just research support from the following um, organizations. And so I'm going to just start out uh, just describing um, what's normal in the vagina, going through the differential diagnosis of vaginitis. And I am going to focus on BV and TRIC, but we're, I'm going to wrap up with Candida. Um, vaginitis, okay? So the vagina is um, it's a very dynamic ecosystem. And so the, the, I think we're learning more and more now about uh, the microbiome and our um, normal and healthy bacteria that we have pretty much at every orifice in our body. Um, and the vagina is no different where we have normal bacterial flora that's dominated by lactobacilli. And some of the lactobacilli actually produce hydrogen peroxide, which is a very um, uh, potent microbicide. The vagina is acidic um, in its normal state and the pH usually less than 4.5. Um, and in, that inhibits also the growth of bacteria. And, Normal vaginal discharge, it varies by cycle, um, where a woman is in her cycle, but clear to white, odorless, and sometimes, uh, you know, high viscosity, but it, it does vary a bit. And that's an important piece in terms of educating our patients, because sometimes patients don't realize that there is a normal variation um, that's to be expected. The vagina has lots of different defenses. One is the mucosal barrier. Um, and that's a physical barrier, but also there's a mucus stream um, that is there that kind of wipes out pathogens, um, which is one of the rationales for why we douching is not recommended. Um, vaginal flora um, provides, you know, competitive inhibition of other pathogens. So the, the normal bacteria kind of can outcompete pathogenic bacteria. Also, those organisms can produce uh, antimicrobial compounds. And then those, some of those compounds I've listed here, lysozyme, lactoferrin, zinc, um, peroxidases, et cetera. And of course, our immune system plays a role here as well, and that's cell-mediated and humoral immunity. So how do we know something's gone awry? Um, well, typically symptoms include an abnormal vaginal discharge, um, itching may be part of uh, the symptoms, irritation, and odor. So those are the more common complaints. And those of you who work in an STD venue or family planning venues, et cetera, you, you, you probably see this uh, quite often. The most common types of uh, vaginitis or vaginoses uh, would be BV. Bacterial vaginosis is the most common, um, followed by yeast or vulvovaginal candidiasis and then trichomoniasis. Now, there are other causes of what could um, lead a woman to present with vaginitis that aren't really actually, not all of these are actually vaginitis. So like mucopurulent cervicitis could lead a woman to have an abnormal discharge possibly an odor, you know, she wouldn't know where it's coming from. I mean, she's having a discharge from her vagina. So as providers, when we do the exam, we would help sort that out. Chemical irritations from products um, could lead one to have uh, symptoms of vaginitis. Herpes simplex virus, Dr. Hook talked today about how common this virus is, has lots of different presentations. Um, and oftentimes it can be kind of subtle in presentation to where a woman may just feel some irritation. Um, and unless, you know, she really takes a, a, a good mirror and, and sometimes it's, you know, not all of us practice yoga. So um, it can be difficult to do an exam and see what's going on. Um, and that could lead to some irritation that leads a woman into clinic. Allergic reactions, um, other primary dermatologic problems like lichen planus. Um, can uh, cause a woman to have these symptoms. Desquamative inflammatory vaginitis is um, a process. I, we really don't know what causes it. 
um, that can lead to a very profuse foul discharge with lots of white cells and um, really no um, pathogens um, that are detected. So if a woman is coming in repeatedly to clinic, for instance, and having um, you know this awful discharge and we're not uncovering an etiology, I would refer her to a GYN colleague who could biopsy her um, and, or help, you know, uh, determine if this is in play or, or like in Plantis or something else. And then finally the foreign bodies and we've all had the um, unsettling um, uh, experience of finding long forgotten tampons um, or other things um, in the vagina. So how do we make a diagnosis? Of course like everything in medicine we want to listen to our patients, get a history, find out you know how long things have been around, uh, the symptoms. Um, what the symptoms are, the characteristics. We want to do a good exam, um, both externally and internally. Note the appearance of the discharge and the location of the discharge. Uh, that can be a bit challenging sometimes if there's a lot of discharge, but trying to sort out, you know, is it from the vagina, is it from the cervix? We want to collect our specimens. Um, vaginal specimens in particular should be taken from the vaginal wall. Uh, we should avoid the cervical vaginal pool for that because uh, the cervical vaginal pool will give us an alkaline pH um, because those are cervical secretions. So we want to take uh, those specimens from the wall where we can have the best chance of getting an accurate acidic pH if it's present. And then we, um, if those of us who have access to point of care slides, um, wet preps, uh, we take a look at, at uh, the specimen that way. So this is a woman, uh, she's 35, she comes to clinic with a three-day history of an abnormal discharge and odor. She has no other symptoms, and looking at her chart, um, you see that she's been in six times in the last year with BV. Um, and at least three of four of the AMSL criteria were fulfilled each of those times. And that's an important point to look at, um, you know, how is the diagnosis of BV being made? Because depending on where the patient is being seen, um, there may sometimes the AMSL criteria are circumvented or full criteria are, are not used. And, and so that can add to the, what's already a difficult clinical management situation. She does not do, she, had, she reported two male partners in the past uh, six months and sometimes use condoms. That's a uh, very common um, response, at least for our patients in our STD clinic. Um, this is a picture of uh, a classic, absolutely classic uh, bacterial vaginosis discharge. So you get a sense of this discharge before you ever put the speculum in. This is uh, why the visual inspection of the external genitalia is always important. Um, so not only are you looking for lesions and, and other findings, but you can also you know, not make note of um, the quality of the discharge here. So this is an adherent homogeneous vaginal discharge. pH is 7, the WIF test is positive, and you can see on the slide the upper panel demonstrates clue cells. So BV, as I mentioned, is the most common cause of vaginitis. The prevalence varies by population, but the bottom line is and it's very common in many populations. Um, so very widely distributed. It's associated with a variety of different obstetric and gynecologic conditions, such as premature rupture of membranes, pelvic inflammatory disease, post-abortal PID, um, and post-abortal um, or post-surgical infection. More recently, more data um, demonstrating some uh, uh, association with acquisition of HIV, um, and then there are also some other uh, lesser known or not as well documented but in as many studies, but with mucopurulent cervicitis or uh, cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. So a lot of negative outcomes associated with BV um, in the literature. What is it? How do you define it? This is difficult. And those of you who have to describe this or counsel women who come in repeatedly, um, it's always a challenge. So it's a polymicrobial syndrome. So unlike gonorrhea or chlamydia or syphilis where we have one bug, bacteria, um, that we're um, detecting that causes the infection, we have multiple bacteria that are in play here. 
And so it's this polymicrobial syndrome where you get this replacement of normal hydrogen peroxide producing lactobacilli um, and instead an overgrowth of a lot of times anaerobic bacteria. Um, Provotella is one of those uh, that is often found, Mobiluncus, Gardnerella vaginalis, urea plasma, mycoplasma, and then some bacteria that are not even, you can't even culture. Why does this happen? That's a million dollar question. Um, it just, it's not really clear cut um, why women experience BV. There's a lot of different hypotheses and different risks for BV are found in different studies, but not one single magic bullet here. This is a busy, and this is not going to project well, so let me just sum up this, um, this uh, slide. This, this is a figure that was in an article written by a colleague, uh, Dr. Jane Schwebke, and also Dr. Christine Musney at UAB. And um, this is a paper they wrote about the role of Gardnerella vaginalis in the pathogenesis of uh, bacterial vaginosis. And so this is one of the hypotheses that's being, um, that is put forth about um, the role that this particular bug plays in the pathogenesis of BV. And I thought it was quite interesting. And, and because women are not born with GVAG um, or Gardnerella vaginalis in their vagina. So, you know, when a, a woman's born, she's, or a girl, she's colonized with the, the bacteria from her mom. And over time, um, as she goes through puberty, then she, the vaginal flora is taken over more by lactobacilli. Um, but as a woman becomes sexually active, then in, in this particular conceptual model, she gets infected with GVAG at some point. So this model is actually promulgating that, that BV is sexually transmitted. We know it's sexually associated. We don't consider it really an STI um, at this point, but um, definitely sexually associated. And then GVAG in particular is, is uh, very good at adhering to the vaginal epithelium. Um, it's a bit better at causing inflammation than some of these other bacteria that it also is found with. Um, and then it's particularly good at putting, uh, creating biofilm. And those of you who've heard of biofilms, we worry about them a lot in infectious diseases because this is why, you know, if you get a infection on your prosthetic knee joint, we have to take the joint out, we can't cure it with antibiotics. Um, same concept for any type of infection over any um, sort of um, um, material um, because a biofilm from the bacteria sets up on that um, fake material or, or what is not vascularized material. But a biofilm in um, the vagina is just it's an environment of bacteria that really communicate with each other and also can protect each other from antibiotic exposure, make them a bit more resilient. So it's thought that GVAG may play a big role in this. Now this has yet to be proven, okay? So this is one of the hypotheses, um, but it explains some of the other things that I'm gonna get into later. Um, but the other thing that the, to mention is that going back to the vagina being in a dynamic ecosystem, also this interplay between lactobacilli and Gardnerella or other, the other organisms is also dynamic. Um, and so this fluctuates over time. And you can see here the arrows on each end are when a woman starts her menses. Um, and you can see that in red, you have the Gardnerella um, or the Bacteroides morphotypes, and in blue, the Lactobacillus morphotypes. And how, you know, around the menstrual cycle, you have those GVAG and Bacteroides morphotypes that start predominating, and then over time, they decline, and you get the lacto predominant, and then the period starts again, and then they flip flop around more. And this is in a woman who's not treated for BV. So this is kind of a, a natural history, if you will of what can happen. So that also further complicates things because that's, uh, like I said, this isn't a woman who's not treated and it's just kind of what's going on with her physiologically um, and hormonally and how these different um, populations are switching on and off. 
So how do we make the diagnosis? I think most of you guys are familiar with AMSL criteria. This is what uh, the majority of people, I think, still are using in the clinical setting. And this is where we use, uh, we want at least three of the following four criteria to be met. So pH of greater than 4.5, the presence of clue cells, and there's some data that show that if you also raise the bar and say at least 20% of those Squamous epithelial cells should be clue cells. It increases the specificity of the diagnosis. Um, a positive amine or WIF test, that's uh, the fish smell when you add the KOH and it releases. Um, and then that homogeneous um, vaginal discharge. So, for instance, a woman who comes in with the clumpy discharge of yeast does not get a credit point towards the AMSL criteria, okay? So just uh, some pictures of some very classic, beautiful clue cells there in the middle, but I, I find that they rarely look quite that classic. Um, usually they're uh, not quite that covered up with bacteria. Um, and, and you can see at the, t um, I guess it's at the right-hand corner, the, the one that says not a clue cell, that you have some bacteria on the edges, but it's not um, as covered up. So as you can tell this is a bit um, challenging sometimes, I think, for people to decide what is and is not a clue cell, to be honest. Um, the AMSL criteria um, are not perfect, obviously, um, because there's some subjectivity involved here. Um, and th this uh, table here just points out the sensitivity and specificity of each specific um, AMSL criteria and then the different combinations thereof. And the point of it is at the very bottom, you see that the AMSL criteria is about 69% sensitive for diagnosing BV and about 93% specific. And that's really the best of all worlds in terms of the combination of the different criteria that you can use. But if you had to pick one of them, if you could only use one of them, pH is actually um, the best performing um, one, individual one. one. And I think that's interesting because I find that pH is the one that when I talk with providers um, in other places, um, that's the one that tends to get, get deleted um, the most often or not, it's not being performed. Um, so it really can be a, a helpful addition. There are other tests out there um, that are more rapid tests. The firm VP3 um, that looks at uh, high concentrations of GVAG. GVAG does not have to absolutely be present at the time that a woman has BV, though. Um, but th this test does perform well. It, it, it will be more expensive than a, a wet prep. And then there's a BV blue test that looks at sialidase activity, which also is an indicator of BV. And then the Nugent score, the last one here, that gram stain, that is a very specific research-based test. So um, the lab reading it needs to be trained to actually score these um, gram stains appropriately. So I found, um, and maybe others can correct me, but I've, I've not seen um, gr vaginal gram stains as part of clinical care that are appropriately graded um, per the Nugent score. Treatment, uh, it, it's the same uh, 2015 guidelines. Uh, we're still working off of the 2015 STD uh, guidelines from the CDC. So you have your metronidazole um, seven-day oral regimen um, or metro gel for five days, clindamycin cream for seven days, and then the alternatives, the uh, two different regimens of tenidazole, um, and then a couple of different clindamycin regimens. Um, so there is a uh, you know, it can be helpful in some individuals, and this is really anecdotal information to potentially switch if one is not, like, say, metronidazole is not working, to try clindamycin, for instance. Um, and part of the rationale for that would be that, though there's not a lot of data behind this, there are some evidence that perhaps there's some resistance in some of these bugs. Um, so maybe one regimen would work be better than the other. Now, I wanted to let you guys know of this new drug, cignitazole, um, and unfortunately, it's still related to metronidazole and tenidazole. 
Um, it, so it's in that class. So if someone has an allergy to those drugs, uh, to Metro or tenitazole, we, I, I don't think they would need to, they should take secnitazole. But the good news is uh, that this was recently approved for a two gram dose, um, single dose uh, treatment for BV. Um, and the cure rates are comparable to the seven day course of the metronidazole. Um, and it was an effective for people who had recurrent BV and those who did not have that history of recurrent BV. Um, look to be safe. There's no alcohol restrictions for this one. And I don't know why not that we don't have alcohol restrictions for this one and we do the others. Um, but this is another potential uh, drug in our, our armamentarium at this point. Um, it has not been added to the guidelines because the guidelines haven't met since that this has been approved. But this is the newest kit on the block. Now, those of us in the clinic struggle oftentimes with women presenting with recurrent BV. And rates are up to 70% within three months, which is um, ridiculous. Um, but And part of that reflects that we still don't know a lot about what causes BV and how to prevent it. So some of the hypotheses for this recurrence is, you know, are, are women being reinfected through sex, um, sexual activity, um, or the lactobacilli just not recolonizing? Um, are we just not treating long enough? Are there some other host factors in play? Or are, are some of these bugs resistant? Because we're not able to test res for resistance routinely. Not to mention there's not any one bug that's associated with this. Um, there are data um, from earlier trials that there are higher recurrence rates associated with the shorter duration therapies, and hence the reason that the 2-gram metronidazole was dropped several years ago from the guidelines, and the three-day clindamycin course is no longer first line. Um, I did ask one of the primary researchers on the um, signitazole trials if we knew anything about recurrence rates with the 2-gram dose of signitazole, and apparently we do not know yet how what the recurrence rates will look like with this new drug, since it is a single dose therapy. So stay tuned for that. So what do we do for these women with recurrence? Well, after treating the initial episode, um, suppression with Metrogel twice weekly for four to six months is one strategy. Um, another one is oral metronidazole and then intravaginal boric acid. And there's not any one duration associated with this regimen, like duration of how long to do the boric acid. And then the suppressive metronidazole gel twice weekly for four to six months. And then there's another regimen that's in the guidelines that was studied in women in, um, in Africa that involves oral metronidazole and oral flu fluconazole monthly. And... So those are all possibilities um, for women. The thought is with the suppressive regimens, those were likely just kind of re-pushing the clock back in terms of when they present again. Um, but that actually has value in and of itself for a variety of reasons. So some of the newer things with BV, um, biofilm um, is the, the issues around biofilm um, are gaining more and more attention, and there's different ways to disrupt biofilm. Boric acid has been around a long time. It's what we're most familiar with, but there are other agents that are going to be studied. I've mentioned the resistance um, issues, and then there were data presented at an um, AIDS conference that, um, interestingly, showed that some of the pathogens associated with BV directly um, interacted with vaginal PrEP. Um, so vaginal tenofovir that was being used for HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis was actually um, uh, rendered less effective by some of these organisms. So they, they, that was really interesting um, information. And also GVAG and Prevotella were specifically associated with increased um, inflammation in the vaginal canal. Just to show you a picture of uh, biofilm, um, below you can see in that lower right-hand corner, um, that is actually the, the purple around the cell there. Um, that's the biofilm, but that is actually a clue cell that is coming off of the squamous epithelium. Um, so the, in, up, up top, you can see where the biofilm is lit up 
there. So the thought being, well, maybe we'd need to disrupt that, um, the biofilm, in order to um, then be able to deliver effective therapy to that area. So that is continuing to be studied, and I know that we have a, a study that um, the STICTG that Dr. Hook leads, um, just I think they're in the process of wrapping it up, looking at um, an agent related to this. All right. So the next case is a woman who just presents to clinic. She's 25. She comes in for an STD checkup, and everything was normal except her pH was elevated. But then on wet prep, you notice she has rare white cells, but she has a lot of trick on her wet prep, and no clue cells, surprisingly. So she's treated with 2 grams of metronidazole. So trick is very common. It's the most common treatable or curable STI. Um, the estimate, and this is a parasite, just to remind people, um, the estimates which are kind of dated at this point, but I think still the most recent worldwide estimates, 248 million new cases worldwide, and that was back in 20, 2005. In terms of the U.S. population, about 3% of women are infected. Prevalence increases with age, and um, we see the highest rates in African-American women, Symptoms totally not predictive of the presence of trick. And then in another study where um, actually they, this uh, study that I cite below was performed in women, um, really specimens from women who were already undergoing treatment for gonorrhea and chlamydia. So that was a different population than um, the, the NHANES data above showed an 8.7% prevalence or a higher prevalence in that particular study. So apologize for my lack of color in this, uh, this uh, graph here, but the darkest color is there is gonorrhea, and you can see that's the least um, common or, uh, STI that, that's on this uh, table here on this graph. Then chlamydia is the most common, but note how gonorrhea and chlamydia decline in a stepwise fashion as age cohort increases, whereas trick actually stays the same, but then even increases with increasing age. So that this STI is a bit different in that way in terms of the epidemiologic pattern. Um, and it, it has implications really for who we, even though we don't have a trick screening program at this point or a trick control program in the United States, it has impl implications for who we need to think about screening. In terms of clinical manifestations, Sure, I mean, it can cause NGU in men. Um, in women, it can cause um, profuse discharge, dysuria frequency, itching, irritation, but the majority of people do not have symptoms with TRIC. And so that also um, hinders um, STI control efforts around this organism. In terms of diagnostics for TRIC, um, we have so lots of different choices now. I think saline wet prep is still likely the most common one in most of our venues where you would look for modal trichomonads. Um, and, but the sensitivity of that test is really low. Um, it, depending on how fast you get it to the lab and the expertise of the person who's reading it. But it's very sensitive to how fast you get it to the lab. So if it's not in the lab within about 10 minutes, the sensitivity just really starts plummeting. So it can vary from 35 to 82 percent sensitivity. It's very specific. Then we have these point of care tests. So there's an awesome trick rapid test um, that has pretty good performance there, as well as the Affirm VP3, and that one also is the one that had the GVAG um, test associated with it. So good performance, um, relatively quick test, more expensive um, than than wet prep. We have culture. Uh, the sensitivity of culture is actually 75 to 87 percent, 100 percent specific. And then the um, tests that perform the best at this point in time, and I say at this point in time because this is constantly in evolution as new diagnostic tests are developed, but sensitivity of NATS or nucleic acid amplification based, te based tests are 96 to 98 percent. Um, and there's two right now that are FDA approved. <coughs> All right, I think I have a, yeah, Andy's going to help me out here so I don't mess this up. 
So we've got a question for you guys. So what is the appropriate dose of metronidazole for a woman who has TRIC and BV? So she has both conditions. Is it, yeah, no, the question is, the correct, the appropriate dose of metronidazole for a woman with both TRIC and BV is two grams PO once. And I'm going to give people a little bit more time. Is it true or false? No music right now. Mm-hmm. Need some music. It's about two hundred. All right. <clears throat> Should we click that? Should we Yeah. So I need to. Cr yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, All right, so it's answer is false. Answer is false. <laughs> All right, so remember that um, that would be you'd want to do a seven-day course of metronidazole um, if they have both conditions. All right, I have another one. Okay, so recommended trick treatment. Um, you would have the two gram stat dose of metronidazole or the two gram stat dose of tenidazole as options. The exceptions would be if you have an HIV infected uh, woman, you would want to give her seven days of metronidazole. Or if a woman had TRIC and BV, you'd want to do seven days of metronidazole. Um, and then recommended regimen in pregnancy is really the same. Um, just keep in mind topical therapy is not very effective for TRIC because TRIC is sequestered in the glands. And so you need systemic therapy in that situation to, to get this uh, parasite. Um, metronide is all safe in all stages of pregnancy. You know, we have the alcohol restrictions, 24 hours for um, metronide is all, 72 hours for tenidazole. Um, and if breastfeeding, it says consult guidelines. Um, TRIC and um, HIV, there are interactions or several different mechanisms by which that happens. There's a mechanical disruption of an epithelial barrier. There's um, inflammation from the cellular immune response. Um, TRIC may actually impair the immune response in the vagina by um, decreasing SLPI or the secretory leukoprotease um, inhibitor and other immune factors. And then TRIC impacts the vaginal flora, which then in turn can put a woman at risk for um, HIV, including increasing her susceptibility to BV and the persistence of abnormal vaginal flora. Um, in terms of treatment in HIV, as I mentioned, the treatment of choice would be that seven-day regimen. And I'm not going to belabor this slide in the interest of time, but uh, Dr. Patty Kissinger at LSU performed a randomized controlled trial to, um, to examine this question and did find that there was a significant um, increase in efficacy if, for the seven-day course versus that two-gram stat dose course in women with HIV. And that's primarily the rationale that informed the guideline change for HIV-positive women. So this particular woman, um, she was treated at her local health department. She comes back to clinic in six weeks for follow-up. Still no complaints, but her wet prep still positive for trick. She says she did not vomit her stat dose of metronidazole, and she has not had sex at all since her treatment. I think we've got another mentimeter. To the next. So what would you do next? She's had a two-gram stat dose, and she still has trick. Would you give seven days of metronidazole? Would you crank it up even higher and give her two grams a day for seven days? Would you send her out for the boric acid, call the CDC, or would you do boric acid and call the CDC? So I'm going to go ahead and well, you most of you guys got that. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, so with the two-gram stat dose, you'd want to go to that next to the seven-day course. Um, and then, so whenever we see a trick treatment failure, of course, with all STIs, period, we want to ask, is this a reinfection we're dealing with? And so we want to take the sexual history again. Um, but if we feel like um, reinfection is not likely, then we need to think about 
upping or changing the treatment. And when it comes to TRIC, unfortunately, we're left with the five nitromidazole class. So we either got metronidazole or tenidazole. So as I mentioned, if she had a stat dose and she failed, you'd do seven days of metronidazole. If she failed the seven days of metronidazole, then that's when we'd go to the metronidazole two grams a day for seven days or the tenidazole two grams a day for seven days. Um, and around this time is when, you know, you could uh, contact the CDC. You can send the isolate to CDC and actually get some advice in tailoring treatment. Um, there is anecdotal experience with paromamycin, but paromamycin can really tear a woman up um, in terms of causing just a lot of irritation, ulceration, um, that sort of thing. But uh, it has been successful in some case reports, but overall not very efficacious. Um, boric acid anecdotally has worked for varying amounts of times, but the case reports with that, you, usually we're talking like a month or so of treatment. Um, and then um, nidazoxamide is, is also one that you'll find in case reports. When you have true resistance, um, as I mentioned, there, are, there is a study that was published in STD a little while ago in 2011 that demonstrated it can be helpful to send the isolate to get the susceptibility testing and to have some tailored treatment um, advice from CDC in terms of efficacy um, and, and uh, just helping uh, with patient management. Now, if a woman is allergic to the drugs, to 5-nitrometazole, then um, you're left with either an alternative regimen, which all of them do have very poor efficacy or desensitization, which is no small undertaking. Because if she's truly allergic, depending on what the, the allergist, ideally you'd have an allergist weighing in. Um, but if it's an anaphylactic type of allergy, then we're talking about like an ICU stay usually to do a desensitization. If it's not anaphylactic, not an anaphylactoid type response, sometimes they can do things um, more out, outpatient. Um, but it, it's a lot more complicated. The cyclinidazole um, drug, the new one, um, it has not been studied for TRIC in a randomized controlled trial at this point, but overall in black you can see uh, metronidazole and in gray cyclinidazole. These are the minimum lethal concentrations for um, each of the drugs against 100 TRIC isolates. And the, the bottom uh, line is that cyclinidazole has um, lower MLCs than metronidazole for TRIC. So it implies that this could be a more effective drug but we have uh, yet to see an RCT with that, a randomized controlled trial testing that. So what are the alternatives? Uh, boric acid raises its head again. I mean, this is a laundry list, and unfortunately that's the situation we're in a lot of times when we have a true allergy we're dealing with or a very highly resistant case, um, which is why the consultation can be very helpful. Partner management trick concordance between partners is actually quite high. Um, so it is important to treat partners um, within the last 60 days, or if it's more than 60 days ago, the last partner, just as you would for gonorrhea and chlamydia, and, and uh, avoid the you know, sex until they and their partners have completed therapy. Um, there are a few studies on patient-delivered partner therapy that have shown that people tend to adhere to the um, to that regimen in terms of uh, the patient deliver, they tend to deliver the therapy to their partners, but it really has not been shown to, de to definitively decrease recurrent TRIC in women. And so in terms of follow-up, retesting is advised, uh, just like with gonorrhea and chlamydia, within three months after treatment, and a NAT can be done as soon as two weeks after treatment. Um, and so far, there's not enough data to support retesting in men. Um, and I didn't get into it in the diagnostics section, but really for men, the NATS tests are off-label because the, they didn't go for FDA clearance for the men. So it's a similar situation as we're in for the extragenital NATS at this point for gonorrhea and chlamydia where you can send the test to labs who've performed the validation studies. Um, Hopefully, some of the public health labs eventually will be bringing that online. It's for Scythe County, Candice, do y'all do trick? Yeah, we do trick. Okay, for men? Men too. Okay, so Forsyth County actually does trick testing for men, NATS. Um, 
Um, so, but in terms of retesting men, that there's not a recommendation for that at this point. The last representative case is a 29-year-old female with a 10-day history of uh, vaginal burning, white clumpy discharge, external dysuria. Um, and she had taken Monistat over the counter for six days. Last dose was like three days prior to coming in, and she was taking that Azo um, over the counter to help with the pain. And some symptoms were maybe a little bit better, but still having a problem. And if you look at her history, she had actually come in quite a few times with uh, similar complaints and had documented clinical findings um, on exam of yeast and as well as wet prep findings. However, in the last four visits, she was diagnosed with yeast but had no yeast on wet prep. So when I saw her that day, I, I thought I wasn't going to see, she wasn't going to have yeast, that she was coming in with something else and was going to have had a contact dermatitis or something like this. But she actually did have classic yeast again that day. So she had erythema of her labia magus and minus, a clumpy white discharge, and then her wet prep, actually, she had rare pseudohyphae on the wet prep. So yeast is um, a, an infection or a condition that most women will have the joy of experiencing at least once during their lifetime, and almost half of women have at least two episodes. Um, five to eight percent will develop recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis, which is defined as five, four or more episodes in a 12-month period. Most of the cases are caused by candida albicans, and it's the second most common cause of vaginitis. And even though it seems trivial, it actually adds up quite a bit in terms of costs. The clinical presentation, um, vulvar pruritus is going to be the most common symptom. The classic discharge is that cottage cheese, curdy looking discharge, and then on exam, erythema, irritation, and then it's maybe difficult to appreciate in this um, picture, but this woman actually has some of these satellite lesions. Um, it also may cause external dysuria, so dysuria when um, after the um, urine leaves the urethra, and dyspareunia. Diagnosis is based on the history and signs and symptoms, um, and then visualization of the pseudohyphae and or budding yeast on a KOH or saline wet prep. Usually the pH is normal unless you have a mixed infection. Um, so it's possible to have a concurrent BV or TRIC infection. But um, most of the time, at least in my experience too, it's had, they've had a normal pH. And cultures are not useful for routine cases or for routine diagnosis because remember, women, many women are just colonized with yeast too. So seeing the yeast alone, the yeast buds alone, that's not sufficient to make a diagnosis. She needs to have symptoms. She needs to have clinical findings. So uncomplicated vulvovaginal candidiasis, that's defined as kind of mild to moderate signs or symptoms. It's not recurrent. You think it's likely to be candida albicans. She's not immunocompromised. And this is the situation where you can do the short course regimens. The recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis and the severe vulvovaginal candidiasis, these are the times when we have to get a little bit more complicated with our regimens. So recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis, um, defined as the four or more episodes in a 12-month period, we're looking at topical therapy for 7 to 14 days or oral therapy that's repeated for several different doses. Um, and there's several different, um, like 100, 150 milligrams, 200 milligrams that have all been studied. But one of those um, strengths um, every third day for three doses and then maintenance afterwards can be considered. Um, severe vulvovaginal candidiasis, very similar, except really you just need to repeat one more dose. And the, the rationale for the, for the recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis on repeating three doses is to knock down that that candida before you start a maintenance regimen um, and because it, you're going to go longer term with that. Um, other things to consider um, would be if there's a likelihood of a non-albican species. So usually we're thinking of women who have a complicated medical history, um, but it could apply to women who've been uh, treated repeatedly. It's not clear what the optimal uh, treatment is in this situation. 
um, some new non-fluconazole therapy or boric acid <laughs> for 14 days, um, or then a compromised host. Compromised hosts need longer treatment as well. And these are the situations where you may want to send a fungal culture and find out what you're dealing with. Okay, when a woman continues to have problems and she has a likelihood of having a non-alpacans yeast that you're dealing with that the fluconazole is not handling. So with that, I'm going to wrap up um, with the conclusions that this is incredibly common um, that we encounter all the time in our venues. Um, and we're making some progress, but I'm sure many, um, all of us think it's not fast enough. So um, I'm going to go ahead and open to questions. I think I'm maybe a little bit over here. Started a little bit late. When is our next talk? Is that one of yours? Yeah, I can just go on. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just leave that up. Okay. I wonder if we should go on the camera. What's that? Dr. McNeil. Just keep going. I'm thinking, did y'all have any questions? Anyone in here have any questions about yeast? BV, trick? So we might just keep. There's one. Oh, oh. Uh huh. Okay, so the question is that you've you've had situations where you've given a five day course of tenetazole for trick for for BV, but then the trick test came back positive, and you've called them back in for additional treatment. I don't think that I'm not sure that was necessary. Yeah, that should have been enough tenetazole. Mm-hmm. So you're saying when you went back and looked at the people that had gotten that that five day course of tenetazole that had then come and then they had trick and then they came back in, it looked like it had cured them. Yeah, I think that's probably accurate because um, you know, you you only need like a two gram of tenetazole to treat trick. So a BV regimen, it's kind of stretching the tinnitusol out, but the total dose is going to be actually probably more than you would use for trick. So you should be able to, it should cover it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Next yeah. question. So I know in our clinic, we see a lot of maybe two, at least two times a month, but they take the seven day treatment and then they maybe wait a week and then they're like, oh, I still have an odor and they want to come back. Do you just take this? So you're saying that women who you've treated for BV with metronidazole for seven days and then they wait a week and then they say that they are still have an odor. Did, did they, is it safe to give them another seven day course of metronidazole? Are, are they having any improvement with the metronidazole? Okay, so they're meeting the three out of four AMSL, um, so they're really not having any improvement. That is a situation where I would consider changing the regimen, um, maybe going to the clindamycin or do it using Metrogel or something a bit different, just to see if it makes a difference. The other thing is it's always, um, you know, even though we don't consider this an STI, um, at this point, um, we do have studies showing that condom use does prevent recurrence. So continuing, I'm sure you're already going over that, but, you know, promulgating condom use, um, especially during treatment, but ideally afterwards, um, and asking about other products or um, hygiene, pro um, pro you know, I can't talk, but any um, sort of practices they may have that may be impacting. Um, some of these vaginal um, washes that are over the counter, ironically, even some that are supposed to maintain the pH, um, they don't agree with everybody. 
So um, minimizing that sort of um, thing as well may help. But all right. So we've got some questions um, here. So what are the long-term effects of TRIC? That's a, an excellent question. I don't think we really know that. I mean, there, there's some studies that show, um, you know, there is some association with PID, but it's really not strong. Um, and we know this can be a chronic STI, and that's why I think that you see it come up, you know, the older women have a higher prevalence. We don't have a control program. We don't have screening guide, guidelines really for TRIC in most populations except HIV positive women, um, and it's uh, and they're, it's asymptomatic. So it's um, it likely can we don't know exactly how long it can hang around, but possibly for decades. Um, I think the main concern would be ongoing inflammation and the risk associated with that. Um, Asymptomatic partner treatment for BV. So uh, the same colleague that um, has the GVAG, that slide that y'all couldn't read that I put up with the nice circles, um, that, that uh, theory, she also is doing a partner study. Um, and so that is an issue that needs to be settled. And the earlier studies were flawed. Um, the earlier studies did not show that it helped to treat partners to prevent women from having recurrent BV, but there was a lot of issues with it. So trying to conduct a better study now, um, but at this point there's not an indication to treat partners. Um, if a woman has a female partner, um, could you consider looking at her female partner? Possibly that, that may, I don't know that that would be unreasonable because um, there's a high concordance rate uh, between female partners. But for male partners, um, I would say no. A couple questions about probiotics and prevention. Do probiotics help prevent BV? Um, unfortunately, we don't have any data um, at this point that shows that. All right. So, Just wrap it up. Yeah, I think I'm going to need to go ahead and hand this over to Dr. McNeil.